Okay, well, Peter wanted me to remind you and give you the context. So I think oh, when we put it out on the flyers, we said uh, 1 to 3.30. Actually, uh, Peter said we, we have this place as long as we want, but I know it's getting to be mid-afternoon and people are going to start to get hungry uh, pretty soon. But one of the thoughts we had was, as we go through this next session and we kind of reach a closure point, uh, yeah, if anybody wants to uh, go out to dinner together, we can all go out to dinner at some place that's close by. We passed a number of places. There was actually one that was really close called Crackle Barrel that's just right down the road from us. So that would be very convenient, too. It's something because Dale came all the way up from Houston, and it might just be a way for us to continue on if everybody feels like they'd like to. Yeah. I haven't found the car, but... Okay. So you, you took the family car and took off driving from Houston. Well, what are they going to do? <laughs> he's, he's being very perfect about the whole thing. They've read it. Yeah. 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 So this is wonderful. Yeah, this is our spontaneity. And then tomorrow we're coming back too, so. If you've got some prior arrangements, don't. If we get to three thirty and you told people, "Well, I'm leaving and I'll be back," so honor your commitments, honor your arrangements, but also know that uh, tomorrow from about one to three thirty, again, it's, it'll be open to the closing time. We'll be pretty flexible. Just kind of feel it out together. But you're very welcome to be here. This is very precious for us to come and join with you in, in this deep way and. That's why we do it. And we were asked at the beginning, if that's, that's all we do. Well, yeah, the course has been my path, and and then Deanna's been in. This is, a, this is a full-time living experience for us, so it's not a part-time thing in any way. It's just full, full-on devotional living and being used by the Spirit as a miracle worker. That involves healing, as we mentioned earlier. It involves uh, a state of mind. It involves lots of collaborations. You know, while the mind believes that it's a human being, while it believes it's a person, it's like the spirit wants to use the body and the symbols of this world for the purpose of forgiveness. And it's helpful to think that that's the purpose of time is the undoing of time. The purpose of time is the undoing of the belief in linear time. And it's like, Wow, that doesn't sound like a positive purpose. The a purpose for something is the undoing of it. But you might think of it in terms of uh, that there is another way to look at this world in a way of, you might say, simultaneity, where you start to realize that it's all your mind and it's all equally your mind. And then as your mind comes into that stillness and rest, that you behold the world in a very different way. That the ego invented linear time. The ego invented this past, present, future construct to maintain guilt, to maintain a sense of separation and isolation. And then once it's projected and believed to be real, then it seems that the world made you. Instead of you being a creation of God, it seems like that the beginning of the person has a time-space coordinate. I was born in such and such a place, at such and such a date, you see it's like the world is the cause, the dream is the cause, and who you are is now an effect of the dream. And that can get pretty crazy sometimes. Jesus says sometimes you feel like you're just like a dancing shadow, or like sometimes you're, you're just like a leaves swept up in the wind, where you, you feel you're... Your life is chaotic, things get confusing, things get depressing, uh, attack thoughts can come in droves, almost like you you start to say, okay, I'm going to heal, I'm going to awaken, and it's more like you stuck a stick in a hornet's nest, and then you pull the stick out, and then all these hornets come shooting out, and those are these attack thoughts. And you think, well, I'm a decent person. I'm, you know, I'm not vicious. I'm not a killer. I'm not a murderer. And then when the hornets start streaming out, you don't know for sure. <laughs> uh, 
how innocent you are, because those, <laughs> that stream of hornets can, can seem to be uh, daunting. So, this is a very deep journey, and I, I always tell people when we gather together that I feel like we're on this lifelong journey together. We are mighty companions to each other to go all the way back to the light, to face all the darkness, whatever's going to come up, however it's going to look, however it's going to go, we are in this all the way together. It's like we're walking hand in hand, arm in arm, back to the light. And we're able to open up and start to share experiences, share our miracles, even share our, our, our challenges and difficulties, because even in doing that it may help someone, as well as help ourselves of, of loosening from this guilt, this shame around, I'm doing something wrong, or why can't I get it, or how could I be so happy for so long and then fall off the cliff, <laughs> instead of fall off the wagon, <laughs> fall off the happiness cliff, you know, and, and go tumbling down. And for me, when I just gave everything I had to that course, everything I had to that workbook, really to live it, to transfer it. And then once your channel, once your mind becomes clear, then you can be used by the Spirit in amazing, miraculous ways, in countless ways, of what I call collaborative miracles, where we're here to collaborate. We know that, that, you know, many hands make for light work. We know that when we join together in collaborative ways that amazing things happen. Just go to a symphony and listen to a symphony, or, or watch even acrobats, uh, Cirque du Soleil, when you see some of the performers as they work together and in such harmonious ways. You, can, you know there's a force underneath everything where we can collaborate instead of trying to do it on our own, instead of trying to compete, instead of trying to, to make, carve our niche out and make some kind of a name for ourselves individually. We know there's something in teamwork. Even when we watch sports teams and athletics, we, we can feel there's a teamwork, there's a harmony, there's a collaboration there, a fellowship a joining that is very attractive to us, and we just want to go into that. So for me, when I got really happy a number of years ago, maybe a couple decades ago, I started having people showing up left and right all over in my life that wanted to come and live with me. Uh, you know, that's another thing. Like attracts like. Happiness attracts happiness. And then I think I was on the move so much that I, I had... Hermitages here and there in the woods. I had a community a bit out in Denver, Colorado. I had a community up in Traverse City, Michigan. I had a little community in Cincinnati, Ohio. I little communities. With, when I was in Cincinnati. I had a tiny little. It's like a cottage, almost like looked like a gingerbread cottage, out of out of some kind of a fairy tale. And then people started renting and buying houses on the street. <laughs> along with me to be around me, you know. They, I had cats, missing and I have had cats living with me. They're, they're an amazing, mighty companions. My three-legged cat, Tripod, uh, I had her for years and years and years, and she was probably the most consistent face that I had in my life. I would go on these world travels, and Argentina, and Europe, and Australia and all over, and then when I come back, I have this little whirling tail and this little three-legged cat rubbing up against my legs, chair legs, table legs. Did not discriminate with giving the love. Had to give away the love. It was always she was always rubbing up against something to extend this love. She had just a huge amount of love, and at all these wonderful love fests with her, and basically. That's the way our lives go. As we start to open up to miracles, we have these so many collaborative opportunities that come our way. I, ha I finally made a, a, an inbox, like a folder in my, uh, my email called Collaboration, and I put it near the top because I was getting so many collaboration requests that were coming to me on a weekly basis. I mean, lots of them, droves of them that I had to have some simple way to file them until I could take a little closer look at them. And then they just keep expanding and expanding. 
I think my latest kick I'm kind of getting onto is I've always loved music. I know Ken Wapnick got into A Course in Miracles basically through music and Mozart and the great classics of music. I've always been drawn into music. I think before the course, before my my use of movies, which I use quite a bit, the music was there. I was just so drawn by certain songs and then sometimes it would take me years or decades later where I would be listening to the song and I would be listening to the lyrics. Most of us have had that experience where we're listening to a song we liked years ago and then we hear the lyrics and we go, oh my god, no wonder I like that song. It's so profound. We just were ready to really take in the depth of the song at a certain point and then it's there. So I've been talking a lot about doing, I, I've already kind of channel a book called uh, Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, which I think, what edition are we working on now? Fifth, fifth edition yeah. of that. It's kind of kept growing and growing. We have an online version, which has become for many like a pathway to God, where they, they can go through the emotional index and find the emotions that they're dealing with, go into the emotional index, find the movie that they need <laughs> to break through the emotion and, and break through watching a movie which is kind of a fun way, you know, to work through these deeper emotions, as long as, as well as tools like Instrument for Peace, Levels and of Mind. And it's on MWG, yeah. too. MWG.org, yeah. is, that's the online version. <clears throat> but I got to a point where once I was having consistent happiness, the whole point of being in consistent happiness is to be a conduit, a channel of... of be used by the Spirit in a way that blesses the whole universe. So that's where these collaborations tend to come in more and more. Once you kind of get get yourself aligned, <coughs> that just allows you to be used. There's a part in the Course in Miracles where Jesus says, an untrained mind can accomplish nothing. And he also says at one point that you are much too tolerant of mind wandering. So it's great. I always say, give it to me straight, Jesus. If, if I'm too tolerant of mind wandering, if I've got compromise going on in my life, if I've got people pleasing, if I'm avoiding something, if I'm uh, trying to dance around something, the prayer of the heart is, reveal this to me. Expose this to me. How am I going to escape these ego games unless... I, I get them brought to me, sometimes like right into my nose. Like we were talking about the break, the, the prayer, Holy Spirit, bring it on. <laughs> and I always say, be ready if you actually say those words to the Holy Spirit. Because that's a wide open invitation to, uh, to clear the mind. I, I even had a, a retreat I did in Spain on the island of Mallorca where... It was a six-week retreat, and I think somewhere around week four, um, somebody in the group threw their arms in the air and said, bring it on, Holy Spirit, bring it on, and then another one. And then the whole group basically was throwing their hands in the air, and as loud as they could, could say the words were, were belting out, Holy Spirit, bring it on. Well, that group had quite a number of interesting experiences that came on. We had somebody who went left uh, in remission from cancer and all kinds of things that happened. It was almost like a revival. And then subsequently it's, there's been all kinds of reverberations in people's lives after that. But that's a good example about how the more willing we are, the more open we are, the more we can ask for help, the more help can be given us. And there's another part in the Course where Jesus says, it's not that you ask for too much, you always ask for far too little. That it's this unworthiness, this shame, this guilt that we've held on to, this mostly unconscious, that actually brings limits to our life experiences, where we're capable of, of huge openings, of vast openings. At times, it's like such a fear of, of love and light. It's almost like holding up a little thimble with a shaky hand going, could I have a refill, please? 
And Jesus is like saying, yeah, get a bucket. <laughs> get a bucket. You know, we're so accustomed to thinking that we, we just aren't worth that care and attention. We may have all kinds of old programs running, like, oh, God must be really busy. He certainly doesn't care about me, but that's actually the opposite to what things really are. There's all this love and light waiting to pour through our mind, waiting for us to be a conduit, and yet we have to ask for it. We have to really prepare, be prepared and ask for it. So, we've got our, we still have our microphone? Sure. Okay. Does anybody have anything they want to launch into? <clears throat> I was going to wait till the end, but I'll go ahead and ask. Will this recording be online? Yes. This will be online at, at Spreaker.com. S P R E A K E R. Almost, it's like speaker except with an R there. S P R E A K E R dot com. In fact, our first session is already online, so this will we'll continue on. Yeah, we'll be listening. Push it. It's good. Got it up. There you go. This is going to a whole different thing for someone who wanted to keep up. I had a brother that died about two years ago, and I know you can't come back from the dead, because we had a deal, <laughs> and he didn't come back, and if there's anybody who could have, he would have. Does my brother still exist? How much of the way I knew him, how does he exist right now? With just the spirit, you know, where is he? Like you say, I know you can't come back because a lot of people would have. But is he? Was how much of a figment of my imagination was he? Or what is he transformed into? Or would I recognize the spirit? You know. Yeah. Well, I would say that that. The world of perception and the people in our lives, especially the ones that, that touch us so deeply, in many cases we could always think of them as like angels because there's a, it's such a heart opening, there's, there's a lot of love and connection there, but, but when we hear the words holographic universe or we get into teachings of quantum physics and so forth, we start to realize that, that the, there is no perceptual world that's apart from the perceiver. There, in Lesson 132, Jesus says, there is no world apart from what you think. And then he goes even further, and he says ultimately in that lesson, there is no world, exclamation point. He's taking it deeper and deeper to this idea that there's nothing outside of us. So, we have had this belief in time and space, in dimensions, three-dimensional world, and, and, and dimensions beyond this world, and realms beyond this world, and there's many books, even the Arantia book is quite uh, good at articulating a lot of these different realms, and the whole cosmology, and everything like that. But basically, everything that we perceive is what we, the meaning that we gave it. All the particulars of your brother, just like all the particulars of my grandmother, uh, Lillian, who was very significant uh, character in my life in Awakening. She was just a symbol of unconditional love, you can do no wrong, uh, are there by, by design, you might say, that uh, nothing is ra at random, uh, no person, no place, no event, nothing at all comes at random, and that that these people that have been very significant in our life experiences on planet Earth are are reflections of what we have in our mind. They're almost like they're acting out in a motion picture the thoughts that we have in our mind. 
And that's how intimate the connection is. So when they seem to pass away or disappear, it's, it's not like they've gone anywhere. Uh, I'm always showing movies that, that relate and reflect to the power of the mind. Recently in Camus, I showed the movie Sphere with uh, Samuel L. Jackson and Sharon Stone and Dustin Hoffman. And these three are brought together in kind of a, an underwater uh, setting, only to realize that, that their unconscious thoughts, their fears, their doubts, their suspicions, their jealousies, their competition gets acted out, and they start to realize that, uh, that there's some kind of a extraterrestrial sphere that's basically showing them the power of their mind and the power of their thoughts, that everything we perceive are thoughts acted out. Now, if we take it a little bit further, we can start to realize that, that the people that we perceive in our lives, including the person that we be have believed we are, all seem to get there in consciousness through one route, the ego. In fact, most of us, we think of the word people, as, that's a noun. You know, we know what, what verbs are and everything. We know what nouns are from our education growing up in our literature classes and so on and so forth. Well, Jesus actually at one point says, the ego peopled the world. Peopled the world? That's a verb. He's using people <laughs> as a verb. The ego peopled the world. Who are these people? Well, if the world was made in hate, and Jesus assures us that this world was made in hate, it's a world of division, separation, comp uh, competition, disease, death, and so on and so forth. If the ego made the world, reflecting the workbook lesson, I have invented the world I see, if the ego peopled the world, then these people seem to be acting out unresolved, un conscious grievances. And we don't usually think of the people in our lives or ourselves as walking grievances. That's a very, that sounds almost like a Stephen King <laughs> novel or something. The, the, the zombies, the, the, walk, the, the land of the zombies, the walking grievances, you know. I don't know how popular a book like that would go over. I know zombie movies are pretty popular. I saw one two or three years ago. It was quite a positive zombie movie. It was a warm bodies. Warm bodies. Yeah. It was actually a zombie. Was, I haven't seen too many of those, but it was actually a zombie forgiveness movie. I thought well, <laughs> the Holy Spirit really is taking it this healing a long way. If you have zombie forgiveness movies coming in now, you know that's quantum. Mm -hmm. That's all I could say. But so, in one sense. When we start to think of it that way, then we realize that with every person that we perceive, including the person we believe ourselves, there's another way to look at the world. That we see people as whole in and of themselves. We see them as they have a history, they had goals, they had uh, interests, they, they had characteristics, personality characteristics. So we think of a person and there's all these kind of traits and characteristics and skills and abilities and memories. They're, they're like walking memory packages from a quantum perspective. And the purpose of forgiveness is to learn to go beyond those quantum memory packages. You know, it's, what it really is doing is it, it's giving us a more of a direct reflection of what we still have unresolved in our own mind. And when they seem to die, and we call it pass away, I mean, I, I've done talks all over the world, but I think I've done more talks in unity churches than any other uh, church or denomination. And I used to joke when I would go to these unity churches, because uh, I would say, nobody ever dies <laughs> in, in unity language. It, they always make their transition or pass away. And I, I'm just wondering if they're make, always making their transition, where are they transitioning to? Uh, and they say, well, the 
to the other side. And I said, but this is a unity. Church, how many sides are there in unity? Does anybody ever, am I going to be the emperor has no clothes on guy who starts to question this? The, the whole idea of transitioning you know, to another realm or another dimension, that's all part of the, the dream as well. So, if I can just more think about that, then. the hard lesson here, the same way we get down to it, is it, these two are never going to meet them again. Well, it's a seals and cross song. We may never pass this way again. Nothing ultimately that seems to repeat in time is, is going to last forever. There's a there's a longing that we have in our hearts when we think of somebody passing away and, and never I'll never see them again or whatever. There's a sense of could be a sense of loss and a sense of sadness that comes up because somehow that connection and that love got associated with those bodies and those memories. And then it seems a sad thing to never see that face again, never see that smile again, never feel those arms and be hugged again in, in that same way. And to me, this, that's all part of Jesus helping us slowly, slowly get into a deeper purpose to transfer the love, to get deeper and deeper into this unconditional agape universal love which knows no end and no limit. So, I always <laughs> see those connections like you're describing with your brother is that's just another reminder and another step of, of love, true love, coming closer to us. You know, it's almost like we draw forth these reflections and, and instead of looking at it from a perspective of loss, which is how the ego sees it, like, wow, that was spectacular, but it's sad that it's over. It's, <laughs> the Spirit's coming around saying, you can feel the gratitude and the love for that love coming closer, closer into awareness. And it's very optimistic, and, and I feel that gratitude with every pet that I've had, every animal, every relationship, every time I think of somebody, it, it's like this coming closer and closer to this never-ending love. Well, so one more thing, I know maybe concerning this, Jesus does prefer Pepsi. <laughs> Because, you know, when he was on the going out, and people ask, you know, they lose consciousness or whatever, and those why? He was, he was a non-denominational Christian, you know, not really too much in, his, in the way he acted, but uh, he had a deep faith in Christ. And uh, so when he went in and out, his wife asked him, he said, he went to heaven, he saw his grandpa, he saw my grandpa there, and and everything else like that. So, well, did you see God? He said, yeah, he's across the street having a Pepsi. <laughs> so, <laughs> and just, just, you know, next, or whatever. So, I guess, I guess those are just, you know, dreams he's having as he goes in and out, or, or whatever. But, yeah. you know, all these, yeah, after death experiences and that kind of thing. Yeah. It's just kind of funny. You know, he said, yeah, he's just, just for first Pepsi. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hey, no. <laughs> Thank you. That's So how do you explain? So how do you explain all these near-death experiences? Well, near-death experiences, I call them near-life experiences. Because they generally they take they go into the light after some transition things, like through a tunnel or seeing relatives and seeing people that have passed away and so on and so forth, and then moving into this unspeakable indescribable light. So I call those near light experiences and and they're still within the realm of perception. Like we we tend to make these categories, we 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 make distinctions between nighttime dreams and our daily life. You know, there's a distinction like, well, what I dream at night when I'm in bed at night, those are dreams. And then we don't tend to call our daily life experiences dreams. And sometimes I don't know about you, but when I was in university for 10 years, I did a lot of daydreaming. <laughs> you know, where, you know, you're sitting there and your body's there in the lecture hall, but, you know, you just, I don't know what 
the, the, the content is not stimulating or whatever in your mind, you start fantasizing, daydreaming. We have these different categories. We call dreams, daily life, daydreaming, fantasizing, imagination. You know, we have all these categories. And what we learn from the Course is Jesus says, all your time is spent in dreaming. Even these near-death experiences are, are dreams. So they're, they're perceptual motion pictures, like in imagination. What we're, this room right here, we could say, this is a quantum experience. This is a perceptual experience. Uh, some of us may say, well, it's not a dream. You know, I, I have to go back and go to sleep at night to, to be in the realm of dreams. And, well, well, this is not a fantasy. I'm actually here, and, you know, I've driven my car to get here, and I, I don't, wouldn't call it a fantasy. But we have all these categories, and basically Jesus is saying it's all really perceptions. And lesson number two in the workbook is, I am given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me. So what seems as an objective world... <coughs> is actually a perceptual experience, and it is entirely subjective. It it's just seems to be there through the filter of the mind. And what we could see as a room full of people having a, a gathering here on a Saturday afternoon is actually a, just a reflection of a motion picture of, of the beliefs in the mind. Is any of it random? Is any of it kind of objective? Is there any objective world that's apart from the perceiver? No, that's what quantum physics is showing us, that's what the mystics and saints have said all along. We're having a perceptual experience and we're getting exactly what we want to get. Uh, there's even a part of the workbook of A Course in Miracles where Jesus says, it's what happens is what I desire. And what does not occur is what I do not want to happen. Oh my gosh, that's that's a hundred percent perception. If what happens is what I desire, and what does not occur is what I do not want to happen, then you might say this powerful mind is having a hallucination, and not only that, it's forgetting that it's hallucinating, and it's dividing up that hallucination into nighttime dreams, daily life, fantasies, daydreams, all kinds of different categories, but it's all a, just a perceptual hallucination. And the thing that makes it seem so real is the judgment. We divide it up, we categorize it, we compare, we contrast. This is all through the ego's filter. That's, it's just the ego wanting to perpetuate itself through all this categorizing, judging, stereotyping. You know, if we even hear, hear a dream character and they start, they start spouting off all this stereotypical thinking, like all men are this, all women are this, all Muslims are this, all black people are this, all, you know, there's a part of our mind that just is like, please, just, are you, you can actually categorize whole groups of people with, with sweeping sentences, you know, we call that stereotypic thinking. That's the, that's the ego has generated a world of stereotypical thinking with all these categories. That's just judgment. And some of us remember that, that Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, and, and if you boil down the contents of the entire Sermon on the Mount, you could boil it down to two words, judge not. Some of us remember, judge not lest you be judged. If we hold on to ego thinking, if we keep judging the world, we are, are bringing that, we are meeting that same judgment on our mind. And what's that do? It takes us out of our awareness of our divinity. Which, God didn't create us to be judges. God didn't create the mind to be stereotypical, to have all these judgments and categories. We're blocking ourselves from the truth by holding on to judgment. And then some of you know that they've, they discovered the Gospels of Thomas, and I, I really enjoyed reading the Gospels of Thomas. Gary Renards talked about that uh, with Persa uh, being Thomas, but the, actually 
of all the teachings of Jesus in the in the Gospel of Thomas, the one that really strikes me the most is again two words. Just like the Sermon on the Mount was judged not. I like that. It's very concise. The two words that he's, he says in the Gospel of Thomas are be passers-by. That's what his instructions are for us to wake up into the Kingdom of Heaven. So now it's another version of Judge Not, be passers-by. And he actually refers to that in lesson, workbook lesson number 128 of A Course in Miracles. The lesson itself is, the world I see holds nothing that I want. And when you get into that lesson, he starts off a sentence by saying, the only value that this world has don't you love it when Jesus Christ starts out a sentence, the only value that this world's world has, and he finishes it, is that you pass it by without <laughs> looking for any hope in it. That's <laughs> right. We, we're ready. What do the red words say? <laughs> the whole book, the whole course is red, red letters. But... And it shouldn't surprise us, because the title of the lesson is, The World I See Holds Nothing That I Want. There's even a, one of his pamphlets, you know, he did the psychotherapy pamphlet, he gave us the Song of Prayer. There's a great line in the Song of Prayer, the pamphlet that Jesus gave to Helen Schuckman in answer to her questions about her and Ken Bopnik. They had more questions about prayer, so Jesus dict dictated Song of Prayer. And in that little booklet, the Song of Prayer, Jesus says, the secret of true prayer, isn't that a great, when he starts off a sentence where everyone's like leaving him, <laughs> the secret of true prayer, and he finishes his sentence, is to forget the things you think you need. Wow. That's the secret of true prayer, is to forget the things you think you need. You can tell that's why we're going into trust. Because we've got all this conditioning, save for a rainy day, make good investments, look out for number one, don't ever get caught off guard. We've got how many insurances? We've invented so many insurances you can't even keep track of them anymore. Do you have insurance for this? Insurance for your iPhone, your iWatch, insurance for your body, your life insurance, your health insurance, your car insurance. You know, there's just, I, I mean, some of Lloyd's of London, they invent insurances for things that you can't even imagine. And what we're learning is that all of this, these insurances are all involving time. It's, it's a fear of future loss, basically. That's what insurance is about. Sometimes I tell people, I've said for years, insurance is a bet against yourself. If you have life insurance, you take out life insurance with a bet that you'll die. And the only way that you collect on the bet is to die. The only way you win the bet <laughs> is to die. That's pretty absurd. It's quite insane when you think of it. And then think of health insurance. The only way you collect on health insurance is what? Get sick. To get sick. This is insane, but this is, this is what you have in a world that's upside down and backwards. It's got all kinds of contradictions, all kinds of things that don't make sense. So as we work with the Course, we start to see these contradictions, we start to see these oxymorons, we start to, to see more and more like, hmm, right, I'm not going to ever find peace of mind and resolve the riddle of my life and my mind through these worlds of contradictions. But there is another way, which is forgiving the world, releasing the world. Even if we consider the whole world as just a tiny mad idea, what Jesus is really saying in the Course is that He says, give it back. You think you stole something, and this idea you've got in your mind is that you have stole something. Give it back. <laughs> Give it back to the Holy Spirit. You don't want to hold on to this 
idea, this tiny mad idea that you're holding on to, because it's generating a distorted perceptual world that is blinding you from the truth. It's blinding you from knowing who you really are. Like the Lion King, remember, remember, remember who you really are. This tiny mad idea needs to be surrendered. And how do we do that except through trust? I picked up A Course in Miracles out in, in Southern California 30 years ago. In fact, it's probably just a little over 30 years ago, because I think it was summertime of 1986. And so this is what, we're heading into winter of 2016, so it's over 30 years ago I picked up this Course in Miracles book. And when I got into it deeper and deeper and deeper, I thought, you know what this whole thing is about, really, is just connecting me with the Holy Spirit, with my inner teacher. Uh, that's all this is for. As soon as I do that, as soon as I make contact, like that, what was that Jodie Foster movie, First, first Contact? First contact. Con just Contact. Just Contact. Well, yeah. As soon as I make contact, then I know that the Course will have served its purpose. Then anything after that is just whip, whipped cream and... Um, cherry on the top. And to me, that's what the living of it was about, because, I mean, if Jesus had me five years out on the road from like 91 to 96, oftentimes not knowing where I'd sl sleep or stay from night to night to night. I went through a sequence of, of I call them trust exercises, where basically at the beginning of that five years of trust, I, I actually was tuned in and I could get the specific instructions from Jesus. He was basically leading my life. Go here, go there, do this, do that, stop that. <laughs> All the real direct connection. And that connection with, with Jesus and me, my willingness to follow, like he's like, well, the only way you're going to know for sure that you can trust me is you have to follow me. And then the joy and the happiness that you get from following me will, will be the, the evidence. You'll have an actual experience of the escape from the bondages of the ego, the bondages of linear time. So to me, it was a very experiential ride that took me right into trust. And I also took note that Jesus says in the Course, Trust would settle every problem now. That was quite a powerful line. Trust would settle every problem now. When I was out on the road, where I didn't know where I was going to sleep, where my food would come from, where, where I would be, what would I do, it would always come back to just trust. Trust me and listen to what I'm telling you and follow. And that has been my pathway to God. Not really meditation, I would say there's been some quite extended periods that I've had, I call them very meditative, but it's actually more a path of listen and follow. Trust, listen, follow. Trust, listen, follow. That was the basics for me. And I came to an experience with the Course where it was like, wow, I'm so grateful for the Course. I use it first as an oracle, you know, to pray and pop it open. And I read it, and I did the lessons, and I did, followed it. But in the end, I, I say that, that the actual experience is, it's like 1% principle and 99% practice. That the thing that turns, it, turns the corner in your mind into an actual experience is the practice of it. You were mentioning how, how practical is so important. Even when we talked at the end of the first break about which book would be helpful, something that's really practical catches you. And, and that's exactly the way I felt about the spiritual journey, that it had to be practical. That I didn't want some kind of theoretical thing or a new theology you know, to get all excited about and go out and pontificate and tell all my friends and tell the world about a new... It didn't want a new theology. I just wanted an actual, practical experience. And I think that 
does involve letting go of our past learning. I had 10 years of university and oh, who knows how many years of, of education before that 10 years of university. It, it required that I keep showing up again and yet again and yet again with that attitude of show me, reveal to me, you lead the way. And to me that's the most important thing. If, if we have this accumulated past learning where we think we can, we know our own best interests, we can tell how the day is going to go and how our year is going to go and we've got this I know attitude, then that's the, that's the biggest block to spiritual awakening, is to think that we already know. And even if you talk to teachers in the classroom, they love students that are open-minded and willing and are like sponges, you know, they, they show up and they've got that show me, teach me attitude. That's the same kind of attitude that we need to have with A Course in Miracles. And it doesn't have a lot to do with uh, like, like prior learning in terms of spirituality. I, I think, uh, I remember when you first came, you know, there was this like you were just sharing earlier, how you felt like you could give your whole life over to it. And then, of course, there's going to be some bumps and some, some jolts along the way, but it's like a convincing job. It's like a convincing job that happens, that when you start to give yourself over to it, there's something in you that just ignites. It's like, this is it. This is, this is my pathway to ascension. Yeah. Yeah, it just it feels like it's deeper and deeper and to convince me. And uh, yeah, like David mentioned, it, there both seem to be and seemed to be bumps on the road, so to speak. And even with all that, like, oh, this is my life, and I'm to dedicate all my life to it, to it. But bumps happened, and then uh, and even. Through those bumps, there's still the sense of ignition that this is the way. Like this is the way, and the only uh, the the only point of res reference to how is this how is this sort of my awakening? Because like everything um, everything would come in a way that I would never think logically that that that's how this is how you do it. And these are because it feels like these are. I don't know, this seems to be the path that, what I would call not a traditional, um, like, I wouldn't call it a traditional spirituality. It, um, so, and then, uh, but then the only point of reference, the way I felt it, there was like a, this ignition where there's a sense of knowing that somehow deep down inside, although there was, even when there was some fear and some it became more into ha having that feeling of like breathtaking or taking a leap. There is a f there was always this feeling of like this is the way, this is the way. And although um, part of the mind was like, wow, this is crazy, this is crazy. There's still that knowing within that that would lead like this. What, what's gonna lead the way? And with that trust, it, and then there's that convince me, convince me. Like uh, like a lot of times, I just had I had to be op I had to open say, and there'd be times where I I would follow, listen and follow, and be like, yeah 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 yeah, this is great, this is great, this is great. And then there would be times where I would hear the guidance, and I, I'd be like, yeah, I don't know about this. Like I I, I don't know if I even can. And and, uh, and it was the matter of not even hiding that from myself, not even trying to be like a soldier for God, be that open. And then from there on, it was the way like you're gonna have to convince me that this is this is the way you're gonna have to really lead, uh, like spoon feed me through this because this this seemingly a bit. Um, it's a bit more challenging, and then of course something gets healed in the mind about like what is challenging and what isn't. 
and uh, but yeah there there are times and I feel like even that is a deepening of trust and development of trust that I, I can I think the gift of it was the most like it was it became a deeper and deeper awareness that it, it is a relationship with spirit Jesus that there is an actual relationship I don't have to hide anything and I can openly say I don't know about this I don't know if I can I there were times I would actively say, I don't want to hear this right now. <laughs> but then there's times where I would, I would deaf. <laughs> and, and I was really deaf. Of course, there was nothing. You know, my ears were fine, but there's just something that, like, I, I don't want to hear this. I really don't want to hear this. And then there's still a, that little wound is, and even a sense of gratitude so far, like every every time I have followed, it only led me to what I, kinds of happiness, really, like a deeper and deeper um, sense of uh, wow, and like this deep st- state of mind, and so, and then there's, so, there would always be that little willingness, and then, okay, show me, you're going to have to convince me, you're just going to have to convince me, and then from there on, it seems to flow. Yeah, and uh, and of course I, I I I highly recommend and uh, it, it is helpful to be uh, to have the supportive uh, system and like supportive symbols that can like in these uh, in these times where you're not sure where um, that the support can come from and like it's a feeling that you're supported in that. And sometimes you, you know, even though you may say, I don't want to do this, I'm not doing that, it, it's not really the truth. It's like, please don't um, don't let me stop there. And so when there's a support with that, and when there's, or there's seem, when there seem to be symbols that are in support of the truth, they seem, they seem to overlook that I'm not, I don't want to do that, that is ever more helpful and so that it, that also comes from the place of it's it, it the form begins to merge where it's not really it, there is an actual experience that they're not outside. This is from that willingness of um, from that place of like this is my path and bring everything that supports it. So it's, um, and the, and these things are like the, whatever symbols are, they are helpful in these moments, like in these moments, and this is. Uh, pretty much, uh, it's not about depending on the symbols, but it's also about accepting. And it's like in every moment, this is what's given by the spirit, so it can be fully reliable and fully trusted. And I don't have to try to figure out by my, anything by myself, or even in these times of seeming resistance, or even here by myself, I have to hear something. <laughs> Because like when, when there is resistance, chances are like I went deaf at some point. No, I couldn't hear. That was just a reflection of like the mind was blocked. So it was seeming just um, trusting the direction and following the, the guidance that came in from my mind companions. And that there's, I think it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> so there's nothing to be, I think it's all beautiful. And it is, it is it's not about personal hearing and personal awakening it is, it is a collaboration like that so yeah yeah it's a friend of ours Francis she used to think about this thing called divine providence and she'd go oh yeah Jesus the apostles divine providence Saint Francis Mother Teresa you, you think of it in terms of characters having a life of faith where they just live trusting God with everything. But then, at one point, she started to realize, wait a minute, that's that's still too small. Because if it's a dream, and I am under no laws but God's, and we're all connected, it must actually be that we're all living in divine providence. Whether we're aware of it or not, we may have convinced ourselves that there's things called jobs and governments. You know, we may have be having this hallucination where we we put it out. We say, well, you know, I'm, I'm living on, on my work and my job and my career. You know, we, we convince ourselves of this, but it can't be that there's a few special people throughout history 
that were living in the, off of the mana from heaven, and trillions and trillions of others who were struggling <laughs> to make ends meet. You know, it just it doesn't seem right if if I'm if there the laws of love are real, if the laws of abundance and 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 care and support are truly from God, then it must be they're equally available to everything and everyone. So that's where we get into this thing when you start to undo the self-concept. You start to have experiences of things showing up in your dream, on your dreamscape, but not always predictable. Things start, oh wow, that's nice. Well, that just got taken care of. Well, that was really simple. You know, we have those little glimmers like, oh, that was so simple. I wish, I wish it could always be, we find ourselves saying, I wish it could always be that simple. And ultimately, that's what of course, a miracle is about. Miracles are natural, Jesus says. When they do not occur, something has gone wrong. That we should expect daily miracles. That we are not only asked to study the Course, but we're asked to give ourselves over to it so fully that we experience natural miracles. Natural daily miracles. So many miracles that we can't even delineate where where one ends and the next one begins. You can see where that would take you into a joyful state of mind. Where you start to get saturated with miracles. And you're so saturated that you can't make a distinction where one begins and where one ends. You see, that's part of this convincing job. The Holy Spirit has to convince us, has to take us inward into a state of mind where we can recognize the Christ. That this baby Christ child is is in us. It's still there. It all it needs is recognition. But we do have to surrender and have a lot of this other stuff washed away. And that has been our journey. I mean, we all can recount the steps along the way. I, I remember too when I first came in contact with you that even before we first had contact, we had a phone call or whatever, there was things going on, like you're, wasn't it a, a bartending job, and then you had an apartment with a, like a couch, and, and you started to get these By the feelings. Yeah. By the end of it, you could start to feel that some of these dream symbols were over. They were at that time, um, Spirit was working uh, with me for about a year, when it was, I knew that there was, um, there was already focus. Like, the, the mind training has come to play, what, there is a focus, and what I would call at a time, a next stage is coming coming up. Next stage in the mind training. And so, but, but however, there's some things that I still had to unwind from, and one little thing that that was still there is my job, was my job, and as I saw, it's just like a lot of, uh, it was my life, it was who I am, uh, with that job, and it wasn't even a big job, it was just a bartending job, and, uh, uh, and but at the time has come that um, I heard quit, quit, tonight is the night to quit, and, uh, and then uh, I quit, I just let it go, and I knew this is this is I, I'm not coming back anymore. Where before it was a relationship, I'll quit, I'll come back, I'll quit, I'll come back, and so by that time it was this is for good. Then a month later, I heard uh, I started to feel that there's going to be a relocation in terms of the city and even maybe countries, and it was in terms of countries. I heard to start getting rid of my stuff from my apartment, like furniture, extra clothes. I, I, I heard to only leave enough clothes for a suitcase. And uh, and at that, I still didn't know where I was going. There was no plan or agenda. But I, I, I kept following through, following through, following through. And then by the end, where the call came in, and what even um, I got in touch with Living Miracles, I only had a couch in my house. And I knew by that time, I, I already, I was going to give my landlord a notice that this was going to be my last, my last month too. And I was like, I still don't know where I'm going, but I had that certainty because it was a very clear guidance. And I started to see some reflections coming at me saying that, get ready, like enjoy your place, it's, it's going bye-bye. 
and then and then they came in. By the time I connected with David, uh, he said he asked like, "Where you're at?" I was like, "I don't have anything. Everything's been cleared." And um, and I think we decided that in, I would make it in two in two weeks. And but that was the a feeling of trust and yeah, like deep trust. And I don't I don't, I don't know um, a lot of cases where there is just no uh, no next step given. Usually there's an actual next step given already, and then and then oh like. And then you start prepare for it and start unwinding. But I guess it, I guess it was used for the extreme teaching purposes too. But I, I just knew it in my heart already uh, that something was coming, and I wasn't gonna. The, it wasn't an option that I would just miss it. it. It would be everything is gonna work as if only if I just follow, 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 follow. So, yeah. Yeah, I think what this starts to give you a little bit of a feel for is that 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 the way that you unwind from this world, the way you unwind from being so identified with a, a character, with a dream figure, and, and you start to loosen your mind from such a strong body identification, such a strong dream figure identification, is this, is by following these inner destruction instructions. It's like there's parts of the Course where it says, Jesus was the first to complete his part perfectly. So, he was the first to accept the Atonement for himself. And basically now, because of his willingness to listen and follow to the Holy Spirit, and to accept his part perfectly, now he's in charge of the plan of awakening. So, doesn't that, this is that an interesting commentary. In order to be the leader of the plan, you have to be the ultimate follower before you can be the leader. Doesn't that make sense? You'd have to, how would you even know the way out? How would you know the escape hatch unless you completed your part perfectly? And then in doing so you went, ha ha ha, okay this has been a trick, but now I'm beyond the trick. I'm beyond the ego. You might remember some of that from the Bible. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Satan is underfoot. Mm -hmm. the, some red words again. I like those red words. Satan is underfoot. What's that mean? Depression is underfoot. Fear is underfoot. Guilt is underfoot. Shame is underfoot. Anxiety is underfoot. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's the kind of leader I want. And that's the kind of leader that you have to be the ultimate follower to be a leader in that sense. You know, the first one to complete his part perfectly, then suddenly becomes the leader of the plan. And he basically says, I'm standing here for you. Uh, the only thing that difference, the only difference between us is time. And he reminds us that there is no time. So we are perfectly equal, we are actually perfectly one with Christ, and it's only the belief in time that stands between who we are and our awareness of who we are. That's all it is, it's just a belief in time, that it takes time to be who you already are. It's pretty bizarre, but that's, if you read Lesson 139, I will accept the atonement for myself. He, he, it sounds pretty funny in there, he says, you are yourself and yet you doubt it. <laughs> it's just like he's, he's like extending this love and he's extending this, all this joy and happiness. And he basically is saying, I stand you know, at the gate of eternity and, uh, and as long as I'm standing here with my arms outreached, the door cannot be shut and I live forever. So basically the ego has no hope. You know, you will inevitably recognize who you are, just like I did. And that's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Because he, he was the ultimate follower. He, he accepted the reality of, of identity. And now, of course, he's a way shower in that sense. So, when, when Diana was sharing all these kind of steps, you know, this kind of thing happens to me a lot. I was... Uh, I think it was in um, last year, I believe, 
No, it was at the beginning of this year, I think it was, when I went to Australia and um, Helena was there. And she came up to me after the gathering and uh, she said, wow, the spirits just told me that I needed to go into Google and type in when is David Hoffmeister coming to Sydney and I hit hit the, the send button and then Google said you'd be here and then went, here I am with you and now she's saying I'm, I'm supposed to just leave leave my job, leave everything behind, leave Australia behind. She was originally from Colombia, living down in Australia. I'm supposed to leave it all behind. This is all through inner direction, you know, where people just show up and all they're doing is from inner listening are just, here's what I'm hearing. The reason I'm here is because I was told to come here. Now the reason I'm talking to you is because you have something to tell me and then we talked, okay, and then 17 years prior to that, she had a, a brother who uh, who married from Colombia, who had married a, 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 a woman from the um, United States, and therefore he got his green card, and, and he applied for Helena to get her green card. It was 17 years ago, and... Now the case had just come up. <laughs> so not only is she interdirected to, to come to my gathering, to leave everything in her life in Australia behind, now she's got a green card coming through This was started 17 years ago, and she's, now she's in the United States and she's back in, uh, in Utah uh, helping me with doing uh, broadcasts, using her her language, she has, knows a number of languages. She's originally from Colombia, so she's using her her Spanish skills for sharing things. They, they just show up on cue because why? Why do people just show up on cue in the plan of awakening? Because Jesus is behind all of it. He completed his part and he is using all of the symbols of time and space for the awakening. Everything is a prearranged plan. There's no accidents, there's no random events. Every single event that you could ever witness in this world or any other realm, or that you see on television seemingly going on in a remote part of the world, everything is being orchestrated. Jesus is behind all of it for the plan of awakening. And the plan was accomplished in the very instant where there seemed to be a need for it. He tells us that that it seems in time to take a long time to play out, but actually it was accomplished in one instant. So, we were talking earlier about how actually grace is the fact of the matter, that everything is already already handled, already taken care of, and now it's just a matter of that openness and willingness to accept what's already there. Accept the gift. Accept the gift of pure innocence, of pure joy, of pure happiness. And everything that I experience in this world, with all these 30 years of miracles that I've had ever since I picked up A Course in Miracles, all of it's just been showing me that I can feel more than ever the presence of Jesus behind absolutely everything. That's why I'm really not shocked when I read a headline. I'm really not shocked when events take a twist or a turn. Because I know with Jesus, He doesn't miss a thing. It's all purpose, perfectly orchestrated, and it's all working together for the good. Only the ego wants to judge and go, can you believe that happened? Well, that, that really messes my day up. Oh no, it doesn't mess our day up. If we, if we choose to see it differently, we can, we can actually give thanks for that. We can give thanks for what it showed us for what it, it offered to us. We can give thanks for the blessing. And soon, love comes into awareness. Jesus says, love cannot be far behind a grateful heart and a thankful mind. The more gratitude we get into for everything, and I mean absolutely everything, we start to see the blessing in everything, then we're zooming back up, we're in the tractor beam. Beam me up. Yes. We have a microphone too, so it's just for just for recording purposes. Because I have people who 
who write to me say, that's why I'm forgiving is this preacher's when I can't hear the question. I still don't understand quite what he was asking you about. What happens when we die? What it, where do What is our purpose? Jesus is still alive. So, I mean, what, what happens to us? Well, what we need to do is, first of all, this is a world of, of concepts. So when we ask the question, what happens to us when I die, then the first thing we look at is that when I die part. When the body dies, I guess you're saying. What happens when the body dies? And if this is a dream, then this is a dream of beginnings and endings, and we, we could say that it seems like birth is a beginning of some sorts, and death is an ending of some sorts. And that there's a gap, there's a time frame, which we call a human life, that is wedged in between birth and death. There's lots of experiences there, and there's lots of memories, and many events, and many happenings. When you work with The Course of Miracles, Jesus is like, well, we need to work with your definitions. First of all, your definition of life is biological. You believe that life has a beginning, and it has an ending. You call that a human life. That's, you use the word life, right? Right after human. And he's going, you know, it's, it's actually, birth is not a beginning and death is not an ending. And in fact, what we call beginnings and endings are, we could even call them transition points, but there's even a, a higher perspective beyond transition points. And what he's saying is, you have a, a tiny man idea that you believe in, and a filter. In Corinthians, in the Bible, it says you look through a darkened glass. And that darkened glass that Corinthians talk is about is an ego filter. That ego filter, it's almost like putting dark sunglasses on, like really dark sunglasses. That, those set of sunglasses are the death. It's not what we perceive in form. We think that plants are born Trees are born, trees die, squirrels are born, squirrels die, humans are born, humans die. We think the death, we've defined it on the timeline as, as an event. And then we ask the question, what happens, we say to Jesus, what happens after that event? And he's saying, I'm going to help you with those sunglasses, <laughs> because everything that you're perceiving is distorted absolutely everything. You've taken it to be like real life, like, like you know, you've taken it to be the way things really are. Looks like we're getting that time oh, we have to go. <laughs> okay. I'll see you tomorrow. Very good, we'll see you tomorrow. So, so when we ask the question, what happens after we die? In other words, it could be a version of it. Where do we go after we die? As if we have like a soul that's in a body. It's looking through these eyes and listening through these ears and so on and so forth. And then where does that soul go? Or do we transition to another realm? Or do we have a holding pattern uh, that we have for a while before we reincarnate and come back and give it another go? You know, all those kind of things seem to be very legitimate kind of questions. And the more we practice the Course in Miracles, it we start to have actual experiences that start to dissolve the questions. Uh, we were talking as we've been driving around uh, uh, with Peter, because Peter's like, I don't believe in reincarnation. And reincarnation is a belief system, and there are many belief systems, and even death is is just a, a concept. All it is is a concept. To give you an example of how it worked with me was, I had asked that question many times about what, what happens after you die, what happens after you die. I'm doing the workbook lessons of A Course in Miracles, and I get to this workbook lesson where I wake up, I'm giving my full 100% effort to it, and in the workbook lesson it says there is no death the Son of God is free. That's, that's in the workbook lesson. So I read the words, and it hits me. It's very strong. It's like a, whew, like a big, huge experience. There is no death. The 
Son of God is free. You see, there's something that can take us to a state of mind where we, we couldn't even ask the question, where do you go when you die? There's an actual experience that would just wipe that one away. Like, ooh. You know, there is no death. Aside. So, in the parable of David, I'm actually, I'm doing my lesson, I'm, I'm feeling all this energy, and after I finish the lesson, uh, Jesus tells me, he said, okay, you're going to take lunch to your grandmother today. And I said, oh, great, okay. And he said, but you're not going to go to the same grocery store where you go to the salad bar and you make her the her lunch like you've done many times. You're going to another grocery store, it's the same name, but he's taking me to another grocery store, which I hardly go to. So I said, okay. So I go, I go to the salad bar, I make my grandmother the lunch. And then, as I'm finished with the salad bar, I'm, I'm back, and I, I think it was maybe, maybe before I went to the salad bar, I, I was back near the frozen foods, and I'm, I've got this lesson going through my head like a Rolodex. This is so strong. There is no death, the Son of God is free. There is no death, the Son of God is free. This is my daily lesson. There is no death. You know, he's like, this is it. This is the lesson of the day. There is no death, the Son of God is free. And I'm over there, and I notice that there's a, a, a woman laying flat on the grocery store floor, and she, I notice she's not breathing. She's, she's just laying there. And I'm like back by the frozen foods just watching this woman. And the paramedics came, and then they tried, you know, CPR, and they tried to revive her and everything, and they, she's not moving. So I'm just watching, my hands back on the frozen foods, it's cold because I'm leaning up against the frozen foods. I've got, there is no death, the Son of God is free going. And then the paramedics leave momentarily and then all there is is this woman laying on the, t the tile floor of the grocery store in front of me. I'm watching, she's not moving, it's, it's like a cadaver, it's just a, a frozen body. and. And then, again, there is no death, <laughs> Son of God is free. All this energy up near the third eye, all this energy in my heart, now it's getting stronger and stronger. Almost like Jesus is like, okay, here's the point of the entire day. It's not your, your grandmother's lunch, <laughs> or this is this. And then, as it gets very, very strong, I, I'm standing there, hand against the frozen food, still watching the whole thing, then the her diaphragm starts moving, and and now we've got a body that's breathing in front of me. And I remember, I just watched the whole thing, and it seemed so natural. It seemed to go perfectly with my my lesson of the day. It's still symbols, but uh, it was like, oh. And so then I went, and I went back, and I got got the lunch for my grandmother, and I went on. It, and just continued on my day very matter-of-factly. But that was like a symbol of, of a body seeming coming back to life or moving again, which was just a symbol of like, are you, are you paying attention? Now, what does that even mean? There is no death, the Son of God is free. What he's really saying by that is there is no ego. The Son of God is free. That you made the ego by believing in it, and you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. And the ego itself is death. That's what death is. So, when we ask the question, what happens after death? On the horizontal plane, we're asking the question, what happens after the body dies? And then we go back into our mind, we start to realizing that the ego is the death wish, it is the death. What happens after after death, what is there beyond death, is eternal life. And that eternal life is always ours. We, we can't die because we were created by God as eternal. And it's only this ego trick of trying to convince us that we're flesh, we're bodies, we're time creatures, we're bound between birth and death. That's the trick. So you see there's two ways of answering the question. What happens after the body dies? I would say, uh, I answered that one time where I was, I was visiting this woman and, uh, 
and she was studying a course in miracles and I was resting on a couch I think in her basement and all of a sudden her her son I don't know he he was maybe I don't know 10 years old or something he comes into the room and he looks over at me and he says my mom believes in reincarnation is it so so the, the boy says and I said well come over here and so we get the remote control out and I said you're a soul, you're a spirit you're love, you're light and you have this crazy idea that there might be something more than love, light, joy, happiness and he's like so I give him the remote they say now turn the TV on <laughs> you have this crazy idea there's something more and love. He turns the TV on and it's a TV show. And then I say, now, watch it for a little bit. So he watches it. He says, okay, okay. And I said, now, change the channel. And so he changes the channel to another station. I said, now your mom believes <laughs> that you were a figure in that first TV program and you just converted to another program. Really, you just changed the channel. You didn't go anywhere. Nothing really is different, but you, but now it's a different character. So I said, change the channel again. So he changes the channel again. And I said, now your mom would say, now you've reincarnated into this character who's on the TV. But really, you've just changed the channel. So I said, change the channel again. So he changes. So you know how kids are. They, he changes the channel a number of times, and he's like, okay, where is this going? <laughs> Isn't it great? Ten years old, it's like, let's get to the, cut the chase, what's the point? <laughs> what's the point in changing the channels? So I said, I said, you, now you believe you're, it was, it was a little girl, and I said, now you believe you're this little girl, and your mom would say that you just reincarnated as a little girl, but really you just changed the channel. I said, you have to have a new perspective of this whole thing before you're free of it. And he said, okay, how do I do that? And I said, okay, you're going to change the channel one more time. One last time. And then we'll see what happens. So he changes the channel, and it's a priest. <laughs> like, like Peter was a, a priest, a Catholic priest. It's a Catholic priest. And I said, now it seems like your last lifetime <laughs> is a Catholic priest. You've gone from the little girl, now you've reincarnated into a Catholic priest. But really, it was, it was a priest in a church, actually. I said, but you're not the priest. You're everything on that screen. You're, you're the pews. You're the stained glass windows. You're the little, what is it, the stuff that they... Host. You're the host. You're... <laughs> You're, you're the steeple, you're everything, you're everything there, you are not a part, you are the whole. I was kind of getting a bit into quantum, quantum physics and going beyond superposition back to the quantum field. It was a little teaching in the quantum field with a ten-year-old, but it was in his terms that he could understand, you're all of it, you're all of it. And then he says to me, okay, can I turn it off? <laughs> Can I turn it off? <laughs> you see, that little skit with a ten-year-old coming in and saying, my mom believes in reincarnation, is it so? That encapsulates everything. And the question is, what happens after I die could be seen in terms of just changing channels. All you're really doing is you're shifting in mind to a, a different perceptual outcome, but really you're all of them. You're every single person that ever seemed to live. You're every scenario, you're every realm, every solar system, every galaxy. The mind is all-encompassing, but it thinks it's located inside of time and space. And that's what the death is. The death is the belief that you have a location. Imagine God created you as an eternal being, and you're going, I don't think so. I have coordinates. I have time-space coordinates. You're telling God, who is the creator of, of, of all, eternal, and, and you're an eternal creation, and you're trying to tell God you have coordinates. 
So that's what the death is. The death is the belief that you can be limited in any way. That's, that's what the death wish is. And the end of death, of course, is resurrection. It, we, nothing happens with death. If death is an unreal idea, how could we think it, it could be a real change? There could be a real change associated with something that God didn't even create. When we resurrect, when we see that we're a whole mind, we're eternal, we're universal, then, then the, the lie is over. But it never really was, but it's, it's not an awareness anymore. So we don't have any awareness. Christ has no awareness of death. Some people feel like they know the story of Jesus. Like, he, they say, oh, he came to Mary and Joseph the, uh, and lived in a, came in a stable in Bethlehem and he came of a virgin and then he grew up and he went through some things and then when he was like 12 years old he got a little bit cocky and decided to spend more time with the rabbis when they went, you know, to Jerusalem. And then Mary and Joseph left, and they're leaving, they're heading back to Nazareth, and they go, where's Jesus? And where, where's Jesus? Oh, he's, we got to go back. He, we've got a lost child, we got to go back and go back. We go back there, he's with the rabbis. You see, he's, he's got important things. It's not your typical 12 year old kid. He's got some very important things he's got to teach and discuss. And when they kind of scold him for being this not a good little Jewish boy and for hanging close with the family, when they scold him, what does he say to him? Don't you know I have to be about my father's business? Uh oh, here we go with these red letters. Now, <laughs> Mary and Joseph are like, Holy day, holy day, my God, no, that's back talk. <laughs> You're 12 years old and you tell mom and dad, don't you know I have to be about the father's business, you know. But actually, that was like, that we should have known something's coming. When he says something like that, I've got to be about the father's business at 12. There's actually a movie that just came out called Young Messiah. It's an amazing movie. You start to see 12 year old, or doing miracles, and then they're, they're all, it's shaking things up. <laughs> Mom and Dad are like, they don't know what to think, you know. I don't know, I can't explain what's happening with my son. By the time he makes it into his 30s, he has fully resurrected the mind, so you might say that when he reaches his early 30s, that question that you ask, what happens after you die, is gone. He doesn't have that question anymore. Because why? Because he's recognized he's everything. He's not a man living in Galilee back at the, the time period with the Romans and the Roman Empire. That, that story is gone. That story is long gone. He, he's in the state of mind, I and the Father are one. He's in the state of mind, before Abraham was, I am. So he's, all, he's already lost that question by that point. And then what does he do for three years? He goes around demonstrating the I am principle. And that's why he could heal the sick, because he transcended sickness. Why could he raise the dead? Why could he wait like three or four days till Lazarus was in the grave, wearing the grave clothes, stinking, starting to smell, and he could just say a few words? Lazarus come forth. And why could Lazarus jump out of the grave when billions and trillions prior to that time, when you're dead, what? You're dead. You know that's not coming back, you know. But Jesus was like, I don't know. Because he had reached I am, the I am state of mind. He had transcended death. He transcended sickness. He could say some words, which is the Holy Spirit saying, Lazarus come forth, and that was just like a little skit. You know, because what people always say, Jesus Christ, he raised, he raised his buddy from the dead, my God. You don't hear those stories, you know, it's like, that's amazing. But all I'll say is, well, let's take it a little further. After Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, did Lazarus die again? The second time. Well, yeah, I suppose so. Huh. What's the big deal about, about Lazarus coming out of the tomb if he died again? 
what Jesus was teaching was the resurrection of the mind, the remembrance of the Christ. You see, he wasn't he wasn't here to just go around raising bodies from graves or chasing away lepers or chasing away demons and and healing the sick. That's too tiny. He wasn't here to try to change people on planet Earth or to try to save people on planet Earth. He was here to teach us that we have a heavenly kingdom, we have an eternal creator, and our, our home is not in time and space. You see how that's a much bigger lesson than these, even these miracles that Jesus Usually those were like little reflections, tiny little reflections of a much greater lesson. And what was his lesson was there is no death. That was that's what he was here teaching. So now, as we look at our stories and our lives and everything, you come up across a book called Course in Miracles, and and I believe it's Miracle Principle number twenty four at the beginning of the book, the first chapter. You, he says, can heal the sick and raise the dead because you made sickness and death and can abolish them both. Imagine picking up a book in chapter one and reading that sentence. You can heal the sick and raise the dead because you made sickness and death and can abolish them both. Powerful. So that's what happened to me 30 years ago. I picked up that book, <laughs> I started reading the book, and I was like, holy Christ, my God, this book is, is a, a pathway, is like a, a tool, it's a gateway into eternal life. And what is the purpose of life? Well, the, the ego made this world, the purpose of, of our seeming life with this world is to wake up from this dream and remember our <clears throat> eternal state of mind. And Jesus is just a way shower. He just is a symbol that not only can be done, it has been done. And now he's, he seems to be actively instructing. Every day I get active instructions as I go through my day. Every day I meet people. Every day all kinds of things happen in our life. It's hard to even keep track of them all or explain them all, but but it seems to be part of a plan where people are are being used by Jesus in communication terms to come into that state of mind and to transcend the matrix. To use to use the Wachowski brothers movie, you know, to to wake up to the experience of you are the one. That's what Morpheus tells Neo, you are the one. And then he goes to the oracle, and you know he's got to go through a lot before he actually comes into that transcendent experience, where he can hold his hand up when bullets are coming. He's told ahead of him, you know, you won't have to dodge bullets. He doesn't understand that at first. Uh, he's so identified as Neo, he's he thinks it's kind of cool to be able to dodge the bullets, but that's not the lesson. The lesson is to transcend the belief in attack, which is what the, the one does. The one cannot attack. The one cannot be attacked. The one simply is. It's, it's eternal. So yeah, it's, it's beautiful. I'm glad you asked that question because yeah. these questions, I've been answering these questions for the last 30 years, but, but actually we can join into a feeling, you know, we all know the truth, it's all in there. It's just getting activated. And we, and we do activate it by allowing ourselves to ask questions. The ego doesn't want us questioning too much. It wants to just accept the status quo, accept your feeling of lostness, or feeling like you're oblivious, or obliv you're in oblivion. You know, it doesn't want us to wake up from this dream. It wants us to just kind of stay, play your part, grow old, get sick and die. You know, it wants us to stay like locked into that storyline. And this is going, no, no, there's more. There's so much more. So we always exist just as 
one? Yeah. Okay. That's our reality. We always exist as one. We weren't no, born. We don't die and we weren't born either. Yeah. It's pure love. It's just all pure love. And we're loosening from this idea of being identified as being a part of the script. Mm-hmm. We're so, we're so, even to use the dream analogy, we're so identified with the dream figures. Like, when we fall asleep at night and we start dreaming, it's, it's really convincing. You know, <laughs> it's like we have emotional reactions, like we're in the dream. Even though it's just a being generated from our minds, it seems like we're in it, and it's very emotional. And then, maybe let's say we wake up from that dream, we, we go to work, after work we say, let's go see a movie, we go into a movie theater, we watch the movie, and we start having reactions in the movie theater. We forget that we're in a movie. We put down the money, we get our ticket, we go in there, and we react to the movie. And then... Oh, we go along and we start to, we get involved in a relationship. Well, now all of our emotions are really getting intense and raw. We are just a solo human moving through and then we get involved in a relationship. Now we've got jealousy and anger coming up and frustrations. And we think, it wasn't so bad when I was single. What the heck have I gotten myself into? These emotions are super intense. But we've forgotten that we're dreaming. And so Jesus comes in the Course and He says, You are the dreamer of the world of dreams. No other cause does it have or ever will. You see, that's what He's really working with us to start to realize we're dreaming this. And we can become more and more identified with the dreamer. In fact, we have a term in parapsychology called lucid dreamer. Mm-hmm. You know, where you're aware that you're dreaming. That, that, that's been around for, for decades, lucid dreaming. That's what he's really working with us. He wants us to keep training our minds to be a lucid dreamer. Because we all know that when you are dreaming a dream and you're aware that you're dreaming it, it doesn't matter if there's fire-breathing dragons. We have fun. Mm-hmm. They're flying all the time. You can, we're flying all the time, and then here comes that fire-breathing dragon, we're like, oh, oh, come on, bring it on. And then it comes up and it goes, rah, rah, we go, ha, 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 rah, and then it throws its flames at us, we go, ha, 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 I'm dreaming, ha, ha, ha. It, be as vicious as it wants if we're aware that we're dreaming it. There is absolutely, it, it's, it can be fun. It's like an amusement park adventure where, you know, you don't even need safety locks on because you're safe. It's a feeling of safeness. It's a, it's a feeling of empowerment. So that's actually how it goes. That's actually how my, my experiences in my parable of David have gone, where I've just felt more and more empowered, where things can seem to be happening on the on the on the script, or on the dream world, or whatever, but, but the reactions aren't there. Mm-hmm. Even even going to like amusement parks, like when I was a child, a little child David was very afraid to go on like roller co- big roller coaster rides, and you know, there's certain things. We might have fear of flying, a fear of heights, a fear of snakes, a fear of spiders, a fear of thunderstorms, or a fear of going on amusement park rides that gyrate the body in all kinds of different angles or whatever. The more you practice with the Course, it's kind of fun. You could go through some of those same experiences before where you were afraid, and you notice, hmm, not afraid. What's happened? What changed? The perception changed. Some of you remember there was that, uh, what's it called, the where they have the big screen, some... Cinescope? Yeah, IMAX. IMAX. Oh, yeah. I remember going to, I went to an amusement park, and I was amazed I was going on all these roller coaster rides, thinking, this is amazing, I'm, I'm not afraid. And then I went into the IMAX, and they showed one of these movies where you're on the, like the back of a fire <laughs> engine, like a ladder, 
fire truck in San Francisco and you're swinging out over things and you're going over cliffs and everything like this. And when we went into the IMAX, all of us, we all stood in there and they had these metal bars. And everybody's like, what are all these metal bars for? Well, as, as you're watching the movie, people are, are <laughs> holding on to the metal bars and this, this. And I've been practicing the course for all these years, so I'm in this IMAX theater and this movie comes on and everything. And people are grabbing, grabbing the bars, grabbing my legs, grabbing my arms. I was like, but I wasn't grabbing anything. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, this is the mind training. This is what happens the more you train your mind. Look at lesson number one of the course. Nothing I see means anything. You can tell where it's going if you give yourself over to mind training that you will simply not react and respond to the images in the same way that you did when you were identified with the ego. You can actually see the progress of, of that. Or maybe you've done it in terms of relationships, where you have an intense relationship, you break up, you feel like your world crashes. Another intense relationship, you break up, you feel like your world crashes. And then one day you have an intense relationship, and you break up and you go, hmm. Boy, that feels pretty good. <laughs> Where's all that grief? <laughs> Where's all that crying and gnashing of teeth and everything? Mm, something's shifting here. And you know it's your perception that's shifting. You actually are starting to transcend abandonment. You're starting to transcend rejection. You know, these are just egoic concepts. So it's really good news. It really is. Really good news. Okay, we're winding, we're getting close to dinner time as well. <laughs> A quick question. Okay. Totally different and maybe, well, I won't say that. I actually bought a copy of the um, course in the late 80s, I believe it was. I ended up giving it away because the few pages I read I could not understand whatsoever. <laughs> Um, I picked it up a few years ago, three, four years ago, laid it down, and had just picked it up again, and there's a commitment in my heart very much. But, here's the question. Why is it, because I've heard this from a lot of people, do we not, are we not caught when we first pick it up? What 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 is that all about? Because um, I people in groups and you know course groups I've been in have said throw it out the window and you know, so on and so forth. Can you talk about that <coughs> issue? Yeah, that that is an issue of readiness. In other words, you know sometimes we we've, we've heard the phrase ready and willing, ready and willing. Well, actually, if you're willing but you're not ready, you're going to put the book down. Uh, and the fun part of my, my experience is, is I've gone to 40-some countries and I get to meet hundreds and hundreds of course students and teachers and hundreds and hundreds of groups. I keep hearing these stories. I, I saw the book at such and such a year, or, and then at such and such a year it got into my house. And then I use it as a plant stand, <laughs> as, a, as a doorstop. You'd be surprised. I hear this. I have, I have kind of a fun position to hear all these stories over and over because I go around and around the world. They're all readiness stories. In other words, that course is like getting your whiskey straight, not diluted, not on the rocks. <laughs> That's the straight shot. And you only come into it when you're ready for it. So so there are no accidents in the plan. Uh, sometimes people say, why did it come into my life? And then I couldn't couldn't read it. I actually have a friend of ours, uh, Lisa, Lisa Fair. She didn't have a religious background at all. She was living up near the, in Pennsylvania, uh, near the, the Amish. And she actually got the Course in Miracles, and same thing as you, she got it into her house, she opened it up, and she said, 
I don't understand this. I can't, I can't read this book. I have no clue what he's talking about. And so she just closed it, put it on her shelf. She then, at some point, got, went through addictions, obesity, different, all kinds of struggles, battles, you know, going on in her life. And finally she just got suicidal. And uh, she, it was got really dark. And so she got to the point where she said, uh, she had two children, fairly young. She just kind of went up into her room and she said, listen God, this is the end of my rope. I just, I can't take it. I can't go any further. I was expressing all the suicidal thoughts to God, like, if you're there, if there is such a thing as God, or if you're even there, you know, her disbelief, if you're even there, then I'm, I'm about ready to kill myself, so you better make yourself known to me. And what happened after that was this blazing light appeared to her, and this stream, streaming light just came like angelic flashes just all over her, flashing her, flashing her, flashing her, flashing her, with with words associated to these brilliant, like light flashes. Truly believe, truly fly. Lisa, louder, truly believe, truly fly. Flashes of light, like she cried out, if you're even there, you better make yourself known. These flashes of light coming at her, truly believe, truly fly, like angelic flashes of light. Well, she'd been clinically depressed at that point, suicidal and everything, she went down and her children were used to clinically depressed mom. She comes down from that experience, that one experience, that one, I'll call it mystical experience, she comes down and she looks at her kids and she goes, there is a God! There is a God! And they're like, yeah, mom! Like, oh, it's mom. Mom's resurrected. <laughs> She's been hit with, she called for it. It's just a perceptual experience again, but she called for it in her heart, something, she cried out for help, and there it was, right when she was suicidal, it came flashing in. So the kids are jumping up and down, they're like, yay, mom, yes, God, there's a really a God, and they're happy to see mom happy. <laughs> you know, she's been clinically depressed and drugged up, and now she's saying there is a God. So I meet her some years later, where she... I put my cell phone on the web and all that. I think I was off traveling doing something and she calls me up on the cell phone after she'd watched some of my videos. You know, this was years ago. And the phone rings. I don't know where I was. But I answer the phone. She doesn't even say hello. She doesn't even introduce herself. She doesn't say anything. All she does is I pick up the phone and I say hello. And I hear this voice that goes, I want joy. That's all she says, is, I want joy. I answer them, hello, I want joy. I, say, I join you in that completely. <laughs> and eventually, I said, she found out I was coming up to a town right near where she, she, she actually worked in Mount Joy. That was the name of the, that was the, she started a business. She, she had a nursing staffing company in Mount Joy, Pennsylvania. And here she's calling me saying, I want joy on my cell phone. And when I finally went up to Harrisburg, which was right near her town, she was so happy that she was, I saw her come in, I'd never met her, but I saw this woman, after the talk, she came over to me and she was jumping up and down like a Mexican um, <laughs> jumping bean, and I had to jump up and down to hug her, because you can't <laughs> hug somebody when they're in motion, you know, and you're not. So I, I hugged her, and then, yeah. I got to meet them. Remember those happy little children? I got to meet them as teenagers when they were actually running the house. She was the slave. <laughs> Cooking for them, click, cleaning, picking up after them, and, and they had pretty much taken over the whole household by that time when they'd grown up to be teenagers. And then, yeah, we've known each other, that was, I don't know how many years ago, probably 14, 14, 14. something, 13, 14 years. And then she finally got into her calling of being a healer, and yeah, she's down at our center in Mexico, Mexico and Chapala. Chapala. And but you see, it's all a progression. It all is a progression where we even when we can't even look back and say, why didn't I? Why wasn't I drawn to the course in the 1980s? It's just we, everything happens when we're ready for it. 
and nothing will happen to us until we're ready for it. And that's not something that you can figure out in a lifespan. This probably this this has way beyond what we would consider a lifetime. We may have had many, many seeming lifetimes in preparation for this lifetime. Certainly, uh, Bill Thetford, I, I was talking to Judy Sketch not too long ago, and she relayed this, this uh, beautiful story of how Bill Thetford always thought, it's Helen's book, and she's the scribe, and I'm just kind of a tag along, and this and this and this, and one time Ken and Judy and Helen and Bill went out, and they were going to meet this, this famous kind of psychic reader, and they, they were told about him, and he, he's very accurate and good. So the four, the, the original four, they go there, and uh, the guy goes kind of into a trance, he's got his eyes closed, and, and he points over to Bill Thetford, and he goes, You, in previous lifetimes, many previous lifetimes, were her teacher. He points to Helen. So he's getting a psychic reading, Bill Thetford and Helen. And you helped her in so many ways to prepare her for her, her function in this lifetime, which was a scribe. So he had all this unworthiness, felt he was like just a tag along, and that she was the main show, you know, the scribe, taking all these inner dictation from Jesus and everything. And as soon as this guy, with his eyes closed, gave that reading, Judy said, Bill Thetford, Bill just burst into tears. Because it was such a, a full expression, a miraculous expression of, that went way beyond this lifetime, into a much larger context. And that happens sometimes when we have psychic readings, or we have something that opens up a window in our mind, we start to see, wow, we've put a lot of effort into this awakening. We can't judge what's happened in our this seeming lifespan or lifetime, and we can't put a lot of credence in it because there's a lot more that meets the eye. And, and all of us wouldn't be here having this talk and this conversation if there wasn't something in our heart that had a deep desire to go home, in the truest sense, to wake up and go home. And so this whole talk is really just like a reflection of our, of this deep desire that we have for awakening. And I think it's about time for us to go have a dinner. Yeah. <laughs> we, we've three thirty, but we're almost at five o'clock. Thank you. How are you? Thank you so much for some.